tonight, 17 children injured after falling nearly two stories on a school trip. It could have been so, so much worse. A platform collapsed beneath them, sending them crashing below. What happened and how are they? An urgent plea for help in Nova Scotia as out of control wildfires grow. It's a bit of a war zone right now. The enemy is the fire and we're trying to battle it and conquer it. And how has sports betting changed the way we watch the game? It does kind of feel like the Wild West. I mean, it's very different watching a sporting event nowadays. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. A group of grade five students is recovering tonight after being rushed to hospital while on a field trip. This is why a walkway full of students partially collapsed at Winnipeg's Fort Gibraltar historic site, throwing many of them to the ground. Tonight, all are expected to be okay, but a lot of questions remain. So Cam McIntosh is outside that site right now. So Cam, this was no doubt supposed to be a fun day for those kids. What a turn. Absolutely, Adrian. So this is Fort Gibraltar here behind me. It's a replica of a 19th century Northwest Company fort that once stood not too far from here. These days it's used for things like festivals, weddings, corporate events, and of course field trips. This morning there were three grade five classes here. Students, many of which would be drawn to an elevated walkway that runs along the far northern wall of the fort. We interviewed one of them in an audio interview. We were on a field trip to Fort Gibraltar. And then we were on a bridge, kind of, it was like a fence. Tamim Al Jafari was standing right there with more than a dozen schoolmates. And then randomly just started cracking when we were on it. Then, and then a lot of people just fell down. Tamim among them. I just didn't know what happened, then I couldn't breathe. It collapsed shortly before 10 a.m. The students from Winnipeg St. John's Ravenscourt School. In total, 17 kids and one teacher taken to hospital. It could have been so, so much worse. Um, we were prepared for the worst. Winnipeg's largest hospital suspended surgeries to free up doctors. There are bruises and some broken bones, but nothing life-threatening. Some children uh, fell. Some children fell directly, and uh, there were also some children who slid down on the structure um, from the, the injury patterns that we saw. Relief there, but now plenty of questions here. Why did this happen now? For contrast, this was posted by another school group just days ago. No signs of problems. Fort Gibraltar draws thousands of visitors a year, mostly during Winnipeg's Festival de Voyageurs. The fort is owned by the city, the festival manages it. Parts of it were rebuilt about 10 years ago, including that walkway. So Cam, where does the investigation go from here? So a provincial Workplace Health and Safety is taking the investigation. The Festival de Voyager and the City of Winnipeg both say that they'll cooperate with that. As for the school, people we've spoken to there are all saying, of course, they're relieved that this wasn't worse, but many of them will have questions of their own about how a grade five school field trip ended in an emergency room. No Adrian? kidding. All right, thank you, Cameron. Cam McIntosh in Winnipeg tonight. The calls for help in Nova Scotia are growing more urgent tonight as already out-of-control wildfires spread further and faster. About 20,000 people in the province are currently under evacuation order. This has firefighters on the front line report towering flames. And the premier, well, he's asking the federal government to send in the military. So right now, there are four out-of-control fires burning, all of which have caused destruction. But this one in Barrington Lake is staggering in size at more than 17,000 hectares. It covers more than double the area of every Nova Scotia wildfire in the past 10 years combined. Kayla Hounsell takes us to Shelburne County now where even more evacuations have been ordered tonight. It is the largest forest fire in Nova Scotia history and it is growing rapidly with flames climbing nearly 100 meters high. We start out the day with uh, lower intensity, uh, but uh, by afternoon, uh, this thing has been getting up and uh, uh, rolling like a freight train. This fire in southwestern Nova Scotia has already destroyed around 50 homes. I see it on TV, both yeah. Alberta and other provinces, and it's far away, and yeah. you feel bad, but 
you don't realize what you're going to move through. And the fire is now traveling, taking aim at another community. It's a bit of a war zone right now. The, the enemy is the fire. The fire in Shelburne County also forced the evacuation of a nursing home, prompting Acadia University more than 200 kilometers away to offer its dorm rooms. It's good. It's got a bed and clean. And in the midst of a provincial crisis, another problem fire crews say didn't have to happen. This fire in the Halifax area started by a contractor burning debris. There is no burning permitted anywhere in the province and certainly nowhere within the Halifax Regional Municipality. There have been eight more illegal burns since last night, so the province is increasing fines to $25,000. Think about other people. Don't be selfish. Don't be stupid. The main Halifax area fire has destroyed at least 150 homes. We need help. The federal government knows that. The premier has written to the prime minister with a long list of requests, including help setting up a base camp for firefighters, advanced payment for disaster assistance, and telecommunications infrastructure. We will continue to be there for people. Okay, well, this is, this is blocked off. This is completely blocked off. It comes at a time when there is competition for fire resources across much of the country. The firefighters, God bless their hearts. Yeah. They can only do so much. A desperate situation for which there is no end in sight. And Kayla joins us now from the Halifax Area Command Center. So, so Kayla, this sounds dire. What can you tell us about the next few days? Well, to be blunt, Adrian, officials are saying the weather is not a good story. It is going to remain very dry and it is getting warmer. It's going to be above 30 degrees in parts of this province tomorrow. We broke records today. We're expected to break more tomorrow. And on top of that, our April was one of the driest on records. May wasn't much better. And there is no significant rain into the forecast until Friday night into Saturday, Adrian. All right, Kayla Hounsell, thanks to you and the team. Well, Nova Scotia's wildfire fight grows more difficult. Alberta's is also far from over. More than 15 fires are still burning out of control in that province, and the danger remains highest in the north, including the remote hamlet of Fort Chippewan, where residents have been forced into a sudden and dramatic evacuation. Julia Wong has their stories. Wildfire is inching closer and closer to the northern community of Fort Chippewan. Residents like Beverly Taranjo told to get out. Well, it's kind of emotional because uh, that's our home, you know, so um, didn't want to leave. There are only two ways out of Fort Chippewan. The first, by plane. The Canadian Armed Forces provided a Hercules aircraft and a convoy of flights took more than 500 people to nearby Fort McMurray where they were welcomed with information and for some, their pets. The second way out, by boat. Volunteers shuttled residents late into the night to hotel rooms once they got to safety. They were tired, they were exhausted, it was a long trip. We wanted to get them uh, to safety and warm. The fire risk in Alberta remains extreme in the north, but it's better in the central part of the province, where cooler weather has lessened the risk. Firefighters are making use of the cooler and wetter conditions to reinforce fire guards around communities and to extend containment lines. Back in the north, this fire is too close for comfort. Like you see from behind us here how big the fire is. and It's raging out of control and it's getting closer to the airport. And once the airport staff, once they sound the alarm, they'll close down the airport and then, we'll, then we're at the mercy of the fire. Make sure that oven's open. Calvin Walkwin is staying behind to run his gas station and convenience store for fire crews. We're just trying to assist and, and put people at ease and keep them calm. A call for calm as fire threatens yet another Alberta community. Julia Wong, CBC News, Edmonton. Now, if you look much further south, closer to Red Deer, extreme weather there spawned at least one funnel cloud this afternoon. So that video was captured near the community of Settler. It was under a tornado warning earlier, but it was lifted at around 5 p.m. local time. Environment Canada says it appears to be a land spout tornado. And Environment Canada has issued a heat warning for parts of southern Ontario and Quebec this week. 
Temperatures in the region soared above 30 degrees today, nearly breaking records for the day. And the heat is expected to stay until at least Friday. It is the region's first heat wave of the year. And if you're thinking, this is unusual, there's now a way to confirm it on our new CBC News climate dashboard. Visit cbc.ca slash climate to see how today's or any day's temperatures compare to historical trends. You can even search for your city. Now, Toronto police say they have arrested a 14-year-old girl after fireworks were set off inside a packed transit bus and video surfaced online. She is charged with mischief endangering life. And as Thomas Tegel explains, that dangerous stunt is one of several that have taken place. Go, 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 go. In the Tuesday afternoon rush hour, a young person is seen smiling, shooting fireworks on a crowded Toronto transit bus in motion. It's not possible. Other riders are heard screaming as the bus fills with smoke. It's reckless, it's irresponsible, and, uh, and it's illegal. Uh, and it's why we take these things so seriously. It's a brazen stunt on a transit network that's seen a rash of violence this year. And the commission now reporting more than half a dozen similar fireworks incidents since just last week. It was disturbing because TTC should be a safe place to travel. It's no good. Sometimes I'm scared to take the TTC. Now that I've seen and I'm now going to the bus, now it's really scary. The website 6Buzz says it was sent this video and paid someone to buy the clip. The same site shared another video last year showing a similar incident that sparked panic. Oh, oh, oh. If you're doing this in order to get notoriety online, then I'm concerned at what it would take the next time to get even more notoriety and how you're going to affect other people. In the latest incident, this common brand of fireworks appears to have been used advertised as shooting to a height of 25 meters. All those people were in a very bad scenario uh, on that bus. At this special effects business, they stress safety first when selling fireworks because they say the blast can cause serious harm. They could risk other um, dismemberment and, and other severe injuries um, due to the the size and, and the volume of the effect that was produced. Police were given transit bus security video for their investigation, not to mention this clip, apparently posted as a stunt. Now it's key evidence. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. A big change is coming for Canadian smokers. Every single cigarette will soon come with a warning printed on it. As Christine Birak shows us, this is a move that is a world first. As far as health warnings for smokers go, this one will be in your face, literally. It is a very positive announcement that Canada will be the first country in the world to have a warning directly on every cigarette. Health Canada's new tobacco labeling rules will force companies to add more warnings, telling users there's poison in every puff. Cigarettes cause cancer, impotence, leukemia and harm children. The question is, will they work? I think they should because it would stop everybody, probably even me. Once you've seen the warning once, you, you know, you see it again, it doesn't really have the same effect. While smoking rates in Canada have been declining, 12% still smoke. Cigarettes kill approximately 48,000 Canadians every year. The fact that there is a, mess, a warning on the product gets people to think, oh, well, really, should I be putting this into my mouth? Researchers say warnings do push some people to quit and discourage younger users from starting. Studies have shown labels are effective in communicating the health risks of smoking. At the end of it all, the tobacco industry has the most intimate communication of all, directly to the brains of the people who smoke. That direct line of control is the highly addictive power of nicotine, which keeps users coming back for more. They designed the cigarette to be really, really controllable through the puffing that people don't even know sometimes that they're doing. This bill will create generational change. New Zealand reduced the amount of nicotine allowed in cigarettes, and those born after 2009 will not legally be allowed to buy cigarettes in their lifetime. There is no good reason to allow a product to be sold that kills half the people that use it. Canada's tobacco strategy aims to hit less than 5% tobacco use by the year 2035. Experts say it'll take 
higher prices, lower nicotine levels, and better programs for smokers to reach that goal. Christine Burak, CBC News, Toronto. David Johnston is rejecting a majority vote in the House of Commons that called for his resignation as special rapporteur on foreign interference. Ms. Kwan. Ms. Kwan. Ms. Zarillo. Ms. Zarillo. Opposition MPs voted in favour of the NDP motion asking Johnston to step aside and directing the government to establish a public inquiry to be led by someone approved by all parties. The motion is non-binding. Johnston said his mandate comes from the government, not the House of Commons. Well, CBC News and Radio Canada have learned that the RCMP will offer special protection services to senior cabinet ministers and civil servants. As Rafi Bujikanian tells us, security insiders say this is long overdue. Justin Trudeau pelted by rocks during the last election campaign. Christia, yes. what the f*** are you doing in Alberta? Deputy Prime Minister Christia Freeland accosted in Alberta. Get the f*** out of this province! Protesters confronted ministers during meetings in January. Sources tell Radio Canada and CBC News that may have been the impetus for the RCMP, which is now preparing to offer extra security to senior ministers and bureaucrats. If you go back 25 years, there are a lot of very unhappy people, but the disconnect that we sometimes talk about, I don't think was there. Social media brought them together, says a former CSIS director. Their ability to communicate and to sort of rev themselves up in a way that sometimes involves violence is the really big difference. Well, I think you when Michael Warnick was Canada's top bureaucrat, he says the internet blurred the line between perceived dangers and real ones. Physical threats to people are, are, are rare, um, but it's difficult to know whether that person who's on, you know, online uh, attacking somebody is just a benign keyboard warrior or whether it's a premonition of a real threat. It's not just elected officials. A threat against the chief medical officer led to a criminal charge. It does seem to be a more dangerous environment every year. Ministers have experienced that firsthand. The uh, threat landscape for politicians, I think of all political stripes, uh, has changed dramatically since when I was elected in 2015. We represent something bigger than who we are uh, when we are in the office that we serve. And it's really important. Uh, that we as a country deal with this uh, new phenomenon. Sources say Cabinet has discussed the new RCMP plan. Before it receives approval, the Treasury Board would need to have its say. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Ottawa. Well, these five women in Edmonton are suing the company they used to work for, saying they were ignored, even punished, when they raised concerns about their boss's alleged sexual misconduct. They detail their disturbing allegations to Wallace Snowden and tell her why they are fighting for millions of dollars in damages. Jessica McNabb wants to live further away from her former boss, the man she says raped her in a parking lot in March of 2021. I thought it was a work meeting. And after it happened, I had nowhere to turn. She's moving with the help of four of her former colleagues at Coventry Homes. All of them allege they were wrongfully dismissed from a workplace poisoned by sexual misconduct. A partner at the company, Robin Nazardine, has been charged with one count of sexual assault. Coventry has built homes in more than a dozen communities across the greater Edmonton area. Now, five women have all filed lawsuits against the company, seeking a combined $6.2 million for damages, including wrongful dismissal, breach of contract, and mental suffering. Two of the women allege sexual assaults. The three others allege they were wrongfully terminated for raising concerns about how the company was handling allegations of misconduct against Nazardine. None of the allegations have been proven in court. In a statement, Nazardine maintains his innocence and says the truth will come out. Coventry Homes declined to comment. But instead of taking some responsibility for their actions and their role that they play in women feeling safe at their company, they decide to ignore it. Caitlin Garriott claims that after years of repeated harassment at work, she was coerced into having sex with Nazardine under threat of termination. 
I suffered for years, years. The women say they have formed a bond, hopeful their refusal to stay silent will force change. We're doing this to set precedence for them and for other companies. They can't turn a blind eye to this ugliness. The criminal trial begins next year. Until then, McNabb is seeking a bit of distance and finding solace in her former colleagues. Wallace Snowden, CBC News, Edmonton. There are calls to search for more survivors inside a partially collapsed building after a dramatic rescue. Why rescue efforts are becoming more dangerous by the moment. And thousands flee the violence in Sudan as ceasefire talks break down again. She's staying at home, then the, the gunshot come. It came through the house. Yeah. An exclusive look at what it takes to get out. And an unusual request. A New Zealand airline asked their passengers to step on the scale. We're back in two weeks. Danny Masterson, the star of that 70s show, faces up to 30 years in prison after he was convicted of two counts of rape. Prosecutors said Masterson raped three women at his home in Hollywood between 2001 and 2003. The jury was unable to come to a verdict in the third case. He is expected to be sentenced in August. And several people are still missing in Iowa days after an apartment building partially collapsed. Officials said they were going to demolish what's left of the structure yesterday after calling off rescue efforts. That is, until a dramatic turn of events. Paul Hunter explains. There it sits in Davenport, Iowa, as if a giant strip had simply been torn out of it. Said the city after the collapse Sunday, the apartment building was so unstable it must be torn down quickly. But then, more than a day after the collapse, a woman who'd been sheltering in her bathtub now calling out desperately for help. Get her out! Get her out, they'd chanted, and soon enough, survivor Lisa Brooks made it out unhurt. I was real scared. And when I woke up, I woke up on the strength because I heard a voice. Anybody in the building? But with her rescue, a realization. Could there be others still in there somewhere? Five people remain unaccounted for. Two are feared to have been in the building as it fell. Y'all want to tear down the building, and you know you got five people still unaccounted for. Help me understand that. But as pressure mounts to now look harder before any demolition, city officials worry the building may be too unstable for further searching and are now considering their options. Meanwhile, questions about the building's upkeep grow with stories of complaints unacted upon, including from this first floor business unit. Leaking in two different spots, um, cracks in the walls. And now, as investigators continue looking into what caused the collapse, hope continues to fade for any other survivors, including from the mother of another of the still missing. I don't believe he's alive. He's always helping people and um, he's, he's friendly. Her son's body, she presumes, is now somewhere there. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Bit of an unusual ask for Air New Zealand passengers. The airline wants to weigh them before they get on their flight. This is all part of a voluntary survey aimed at improving fuel efficiency. The airline says the weight is anonymously recorded, not visible to others, but some Americans are bristling online saying they're concerned about privacy and body discrimination. A fragile ceasefire in Sudan has fallen apart forcing more people to flee in difficult conditions. There's 300 people crammed onto this small boat. There's no place to stand up. We get exclusive access to the Sudanese border where thousands of people are crossing to find safety. And hopefully I can make a few, a few bucks tonight on, uh, on my little betting app here. 
sports fans are hoping to score big when their teams do, but some are worried about the fallout. The National takes you deeper into the story shaping our world. Next. Ceasefire negotiations between warring military factions in Sudan have broken down. The Sudanese army is accusing the paramilitary rapid support forces of repeatedly violating past ceasefires. That could put aid access at risk in a place where people desperately need help. Well, over the last month and a half, the United Nations says nearly 400,000 people have fled that country, many to neighboring South Sudan, where residents are already struggling to survive. In a Canadian exclusive, Chris Brown and a CBC News crew went to where few cameras do to speak directly with those running for their lives. We are in the poorest country on earth, and our flight is headed to one of the poorest parts of it. This is South Sudan's Upper Nile region, next to the border with Sudan. It's a place where people already struggle to feed themselves. And now, it's at the epicenter of a new humanitarian catastrophe thrust upon them as the fallout from Sudan's fighting spills over to its neighbors. Khartoum is eight hours down that road. And this is the most direct way that people can flee the war and come to South Sudan, a place where they say they feel safe. In oppressive heat of 40 plus degrees Celsius, caravans of exhausted donkeys bring people and baggage across the frontier. Some climb trees to get a mobile phone signal to let family know they're safe. It's my wife and those are my kids. Hafiz Muhammad Ali escaped the bombardment in Khartoum with his wife and four children. There is a lot of war there. It's bad because the uh, airplane is beating a lot of place. How do you feel now that you've crossed the border? Now I'm very safe. I'm, this is, you know, I'm Sudanese. When I, when I come here, I will be comfortable. Ali is in the minority here. Most of the arrivals are actually South Sudanese people who fled their own country civil war over the last decade. Now they're returning but most have nothing to come back to here. Uh, we, are, we are operating in here. UN worker Mulu James Bure says he sees about a thousand people crossing every day. They say they are not sure when this war is ending because uh, though there is ceasefire, but they don't see, it's end, see it ending soon. In the town of Rink, an hour away, there is a medical clinic for urgent needs. Shushu Deng, who's three months pregnant, took a bullet in her arm about a month ago as Sudan's warring factions fought gun battles outside of her house near Khartoum. She's staying at home, then the, the gunshot come. It came through the house? Yeah. Just came through a wall? Yeah. And the places near her all are affected, destroyed by the gunshot. When she felt it was safe to move, she and her family fled. Most new arrivals temporarily stay in a transit camp. It has drinking water and food, but it's a stopgap. Rink can't handle all of these people, and they need to be moved on quickly. I'm at the port now. How many people are we left to move to fill this boat? A daunting logistical challenge that's largely fallen to a Canadian, Aaron Adkins, who's with the UN's International Organization for Migration. Logistically, this is this is very challenging, very challenging for everything from the boats to the fuel to the to the buses and trucks. Everything is either broken or barely running. So we're having to day by day address all these little issues. Adkins is originally from Fredericton, but growing up, his family split their time between PEI and Kenya, where he's usually based. I myself and all of IOM and also the rest of the humanitarian community are very concerned about trying to get people back to their their intended destination because if, if we cannot uh, we we will end up with a, a long-term 
humanitarian response that extends over years and years and years. With local roads in awful shape, the White Nile River, which is not white at all, is the only route to move people to larger population centers. And these converted cargo boats are the only means to do it. There's a mad crush for space and to not get left behind. This loading scene is chaotic. There's 300 people crammed onto this small boat. There's no place to stand up. There's no toilets and people have to bring their own food with them. And it's a two day trip up the Nile River. One passenger asked us to help him shield his body from the blistering heat. The sun is too hot now. Right. Yeah. So what are you going to do? I need, I, need, I need umbrella. You need an umbrella? Yeah. I don't have an umbrella. Yeah. Even when those on the boats reach bigger towns or cities, this crisis won't be over. There have been reports of violence involving new arrivals as food and water are scarce. More than 10 million people, 76% of South Sudan's population, already needs humanitarian assistance to survive. Thank you very much. My name is Chris Brown. In the capital, Juba, South Sudan's foreign minister, shared his fears that Sudan's instability will threaten an oil pipeline that his country depends on and that the violence next door will spread. When your neighbor is burning, don't keep quiet that that burning will finish there. There are always a spillover. One of the spillover is the if you have those kind of militarized nation, you know people running to South Sudan with guns. It creates an insecurity here. When you have probably an uh, agents of Islamists, you know penetrating and come to Sudan, we become vulnerable as a country. There have been many attempts to negotiate ceasefires in Sudan, but none seem to last long. And those arriving in rank told us they have little confidence in peace efforts. 16-year-old Najal spoke on behalf of her family. The war is escalating every day, she says, and we're not sure when it will stop, and we're worried. Until 2011, Sudan and South Sudan were the same country. Their fates remain closely connected. The war there carries a very real risk of dragging this fragile country down with it. Chris, that, that is hard to watch. Uh, we do see Canadians assisting there in South Sudan, but what about the Canadian government? Well, you do see Canadian flags, Adrian, on humanitarian tents at some of those shelters. Ottawa has kicked in $31 million to help South Sudan specifically deal with this exodus. But when you're there, what's striking is just really how fragile this place is. Without an immense humanitarian effort, it couldn't function. People left because of a civil war, and now they're being forced to return. And there really isn't the infrastructure or the economy to integrate them. And that's causing all kinds of ethnic and political tensions uh, when everyone's all jammed together, as you saw, and they're on the move. So it really is a very precarious situation. Indeed. Chris, thanks to you and the team. Chris Brown in London. Thanks. Next, fans are betting big on sports. We're going to have some trouble now with the gambling this year. Quite a few, quite a few. The troubling trend behind sports betting. Next. Well, the Toronto Maple Leafs have named Brad Treliving as the new general manager. Treliving joins the club after spending nine seasons with the Calgary Flames. He is replacing Kyle Dubas, who was fired shortly after the Leafs were eliminated from this year's playoffs. So if you've been watching the playoffs, there's one aspect of the broadcast you cannot miss. Gambling ads, lots of them. And those ads are bringing in big money. But as Jamie Strachan shows us, that cash can come at a cost. In Toronto, a Maple Leafs playoff game draws a frenzied crowd. Thousands who couldn't get inside watch outside. But it's not just this game. There's the game inside the game. What bet am I making? Who am I betting on? Who's going to score next? 
Walking through the crowd, it was all too easy to find fans making bets. So what do you have tonight? I got Noel Chari first goal, first goal baby. 25 52. bucks, 650 52. payout. It's gonna happen. Hopefully I can make a few, a few bucks tonight on, uh, on my little betting app here. Uh. The phone is the new casino. Thousands of betting options available through dozens of now legal betting apps. There you go. No one's sorry. Twenty-five dollars for school. So what best do you have tonight? Um. So Leafs tonight I have four, Leafs and four, Nylander to score, Matthews to score, Marner to get some points, and Riley to get some points. And O'Reilly to get an assist for sure. A lot of people have said it's out of control. Uh, what do you make of what's going on right now? It's actually, we've seen greater control. Paul Burns is the president of the Canadian Gaming Association. The catch is being able to educate, inform players to the tools that are available so they can set their own limits on their sites, they can set how much time they want, how much money they wish to spend or to lose in any given time period. And there's also the ability that players are being monitored for their behavior and the operators are required to monitor risk to offer greater player protection. We put all those tools in place. Here we go, here we go. Since federal legislation passed in 2021 loosened up the rules around sports betting, Ontario has gone full throttle. It's totally up to you, it's your bet. A year ago, it became the only province to regulate dozens of foreign and Canadian companies, allowing them to legally operate and advertise in Ontario. The province has collected $280 million of the billions of dollars Ontarians have wagered on those sites in the last year. Do you find yourself betting more this year than, in, than you have in the past? Yeah, of course. Every game's more exciting. All the commercials. Yeah. Way too many commercials out there for betting. That's why we're addicted now. Kids. Amongst all your buddies, is betting you become right like now? a big part of watching sports? Yeah, 100%. 100%. Yeah, all, the, all the buddies, we all talk about it. We send pictures in our group chat of who's betting on what. Go Leafs go, baby! Yeah, gambling's a big thing now. Yeah. yeah. The next ad we're going to see is probably going to be a gambling ad. <laughs> what, do you th what do you think about that? I think that's getting a lot of more people into gambling, which I don't know if it is the best thing, but... <laughs> People have described it as, you know, the Wild West and, you know, we see the ads everywhere. How would you describe what we're seeing in Canada right now? I would describe it similarly to that. It does kind of feel like the Wild West. I mean, it's, it's a little bit, I mean, it's very different watching a sporting event nowadays relative to where it was even a couple of years ago. Oh, that's, that's a pop. Yeah! Rob Pozzola has been gambling on sports for years. He actually does it for a living and wins much more than he loses. Like all Canadians, he has been inundated by the endless stream of ads, often fronted by big name stars, touting the rush of a big win, aimed at an audience mostly unfamiliar with betting on sports. How do you decide whether you're going to bet or not? Kind of, it's honestly luck of the draw, especially with hockey, you know. Uh, basically, it's just kind of see who's playing really well and then hopefully go with that player. What's driving you to bet? What's uh, I love Nylander, love the Leafs. <laughs> just really excited to get in the game. What made you decide on that bet? I just had a good feeling. I woke up this morning, I was like, Nolan Chari's going to score the first goal. It's going to happen. Centering pass for Chari, who was unable to control it, and it didn't. Achari did not score the first goal. In fact, he didn't score any goals in the game. What people don't want to hear is that sports betting is more of a math problem than it is knowing sports. And if people heard that, maybe it would affect their ability to bet or they wouldn't be turned off by it. But that is the truth. It's more of a math problem than actually knowing and understanding sports. It's too early to know what the long-term impact of Ontario's affectionate embrace of gambling will be, but there may be early warning signs. Windsor's Hotel de Grasse is a good place to start. The hospital is home to the province's only residential facility dedicated entirely to problem gambling. What I'm seeing is an increase in young men coming in uh, with uh, gambling problems related to sports. Well as Longtime councillor Diana Gabriel says a crisis is quickly emerging it's with what she calls the normalization of sports gambling. Yeah. When a society is completely doused with 
all of the advertising, the pushing, the superhero sports figures promoting, where it becomes normalized. In five years, we're going to have a whole new generation of people who have been acclimated, who have been enticed to partake in this activity without being justly educated about the warning signs of it. Everything gets rationalized and you, you just escalate. In Ottawa, Noah Weinberg says the Windsor program saved his life. It's been five years since he left there, finally breaking an addiction that cost him at least a million dollars and consumed him for decades. As someone in recovery, I mean, how hard has this last year been with this deluge of, of advertising and it's, even if you don't like sports, you can't escape it? I'd say this last year and a half of recovery is as hard, if not harder, than when I came out of the program in Windsor. It's just, there's so much, you're, you're, you're banged over the head with it. Do you it's find even, it hard to watch a game though with all the advertising? It's, I find it disgusting. <laughs> I, don't, uh, I don't find it hard because I'm doing really well, but I can't imagine what somebody's coming out of that program tomorrow is going to feel. It's going to be next to impossible. What's your message to someone who says, you know what, listen, I'm a year into recovery. I, I just want to sit down and watch the game, and this has been very triggering for me. It's difficult. Listen, those are real problems and real difficult situations for those people that have them. And that is a difficult change. There has been a lot of gambling advertising pre, more in sports now. That's something that, that you know, we know is a challenge for a small percentage of the population, and it's real for them. And I, and I say that between broadcasters, leagues, and the industry, we want to make sure our advertising is appropriate. However you decide to play, play safe at Bet365. The gaming industry has produced ads promoting responsible betting. What time scores? But when we went looking for those ads in five random playoff games, we didn't see any. We did see, though, an average of seven commercials per three periods, promoting betting apps. I'm more worried about the kids. Uh, Weinberg says a recent night at a bar watching a game made him realize how quickly sports gambling has changed. I've been in sports bars all my life, and that used to just be sports talk. You'd talk about the play, or you'd talk about what just happened, or what could they do to change. That wasn't the talk in, those, in the bar the other night. The talk in the bar the other night was... How much are you going to put on this? How much are you going to put on that? Can they come back and will there be this many goals in this period? Lots of sporting events. Pizzola worries about what comes next. He has seen the underside, those gripped by gambling addictions, long before Wayne Gretzky and Connor McDavid made gambling a familiar part of the sports landscape. I still don't know that Ontario's fully figured out exactly the effect that this is going to have on the average person. The lack of changes we've seen over the course of the last year, especially with how sports books can advertise, I'm not sure that they're grasping the full picture of it. And this is going to create a lot of problem gaming. Do you have any buddies who have kind of had some trouble now with the gambling this year? Turn. Quite a few, quite a few, but you know. Don't make it back, you know, oh gambling, God, as long as you don't quit, you're always bound to make that, money. That that's how it works, that's how it works. I don't think that's, that's, that's the strategy. So, wow, as you said, that is absolutely not the strategy, but clearly people are hooked. A any thought of, of altering the regulations? I think there is, uh, Adrian, the provincial body here in Ontario that regulates these ads says it's looking at both the volume of ads that can run on television and who confront those ads. Can celebrities continue to endorse gambling products? I think anybody that watches sports uh, in Canada will notice if and when those changes are made. We'll all be watching. All right, Jamie Strachan, thank you. Thank you. A little girl gone, but never forgotten. Kennedy, um, yeah. Kennedy was my life. How her memory is inspiring an act of compassion in our moment. Well, this little one, Kennedy Moosey, is the inspiration behind White Sales Bakery in Tantallon, Nova Scotia. It's a community reeling from wildfires. And now she's inspired her parents again. So four-year-old Kennedy died in October, but her memory lives on in an act of kindness to help those forced to flee their homes. And tonight, it's our moment. Tonight, we're doing 200 chicken dinners, which will consist of chicken, mashed potatoes, carrots, and stuffing. We took up meat lasagnas, veggie lasagnas, gluten-free, 
and we also did chicken pot pie and shepherd's pie. Two shepherd pie. We have a four-year-old little girl that we lost in October of 2022 who absolutely loved baking, loved everybody. She was somebody that you could walk up to in the store and she would go home with you if you were nice enough to her. And she is just the most beautiful human ever to walk this earth. Yeah. Really? Kennedy was my life. We just do everything that we can to honor her with our our bakery and like um, with the wildfires that are affecting Tantallon, which is my home community. I grew up here. We, uh, we wanted to jump into action and do what we could as a family, as a community, as a business to support our loved ones and everybody in the community. It costs nothing to be kind. Check in on your family and check in on your neighbors. Her family's going further, raising money in Kennedy's name for kids to go to camp. A shout out to everyone in Tantallon from the cafe to the superstore. They're all helping each other out. Hey, and everybody, that is the National for May the 31st. Thank you for being with us. Have a good night.